We're back. Michael, how you been this week? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. I'm still drinking that guayaki every day. We're all drinking gua- guayaki. Mm-hmm. I've literally probably... I should just buy stock in the company <laughs> I think, at this point. Seriously. I tried uh, berry the other week. That was good. And uh, I'm on orange this week. And back to the... The lemon elation. It's good. I like drinking it the traditional way in the mornings with the, out of the little gourd with this yeah, filter yeah, yeah, straw. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that in my little garden. Yeah. It's the way I do things. Dude, my knee. My knee, guys. I might have to go to a doctor soon. Seriously. It's kind of it's kind of hurting a little bit more. I don't think it's going to get better. Probably Cart- not. The cartilage. Yeah. No, the cartilage is gone. It's going to go away soon. Yeah. But it is what it is. You know? That, that's how, uh, you know, that's the price I pay for these amazing thighs. They're too white, though. I got to tan. <laughs> I, have the, I have the whitest thighs ever. I really have to tan. I'm getting a really bad tan line, too. You get you get a tan line, Michael, or are you just brown all sometimes. over? Sometimes. No. Yeah. No, sometimes. You tan? No, you're not. I get sunburned. <laughs> Shut up, Peyton. Red. <laughs> I get sunburned very quickly. Yeah. Anything in the mail today, Michael? Nope, nothing. <laughs> nah, we got nothing. I'll tell you what we did get. What did we get? Some new followers and subscribers, and a special shout-out to them, that's for sure. Oh, Thanks, guys. Yeah. Remember, if you listen to the show, uh, be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, because then you get to watch us with our silly shenanigans and our great talks. You get to see the beautiful faces of our guests that we have on. And uh, we're on Apple Podcasts as well. Subscribe to us there uh, for when you're on the go, and then also on Spotify. And as a reminder, the show Ooh. continues on after the hour mark. So you, there's actually more episode that you get to listen to after it stops on Adobe. So be sure to follow us on those platforms. Our guest today is Celia uh, Finkelstein, Celia Fink on uh, the social media and the Twitter. She's a writer and actress. I worked with her on For the People. Amazing person, super, super down to earth, grounded, fights for the good of people. I feel like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's a fighter for the good of people. The good of people, yeah. yeah. Hey, guys, let it be this time. You know what I mean? Amen. Let it be this time. And if you listen to the whole episode, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. We talked about a lot of things, and it was a great conversation. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Celia Finkelstein. That? You've been up for five hours, right? Since four. Yeah, I saw your Instagram stories. Beautiful morning this it morning. It looked gorgeous. Oh my gosh. I woke up an hour ago. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know how miserable it is to wake up at that hour, even for me? Uh, yeah, well, because I've been trying, actually, because I'm a swimmer, and there's a swim workout at 6 a.m. in my neighborhood, and it would require me to wake up about 5.30, which okay. is still an hour and a half after you. Yeah. And I cannot bring myself to do it with any regularity and like the once a month i do do it i'm like i fucking killed it i'm a champ you know i can't believe you do it every day uh, it's not every day especially now during the depression of my show being canceled Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, am i gonna bring that up every two minutes yes i'm in that (laughs) mood today no i'm not gonna bring it up every two minutes it's fine whatever you need to do no i'm not gonna do it (laughs) Uh, good things ahead i mean we were just talking about being thankful for what you have um but what i was gonna say is I've never regretted uh, going sure. running. Like, I've always regretted not going running. And today was one of those beautiful times where this, the clouds and the fog coming in were right below me, so it looked like I was so high above the... That was actually what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. I was like, where were you? Because it looked like you were in a plane. Yeah, they, I, I go to Burbank Airport. <laughs> and you and I f- halo, buy a ticket. Yeah, I halo dive, which is basically <laughs> like from the stratosphere and Great. I go down into uh, Griffith Park and I just go <laughs> ah! and I do the super the superhero yeah. thing mm-hmm. and then I start my jog from there. I'd absolutely believe that actually. 100%. I would buy that <laughs> up from you. There's no question. Maybe someday in the future. Um, <laughs> Life is long, we see them. You got plenty of time. I get antsy so quickly, <laughs> so I need those extreme moments. Sure. I heard a great saying a while ago, do something Spartan like every day. I was like, oh, that's cool. I dig that. Yeah. Every day. I mean, that's. I mean, that's intense. But yeah. Why not? Why not? Life is worth living, right? <laughs> you just can't. I mean, ba- some days. Some days. Well, for you right now, it must be a high. You just got engaged. I did just get engaged. It's to true. World famous Brad. Yeah. I've made him insta famous, apparently. That's Absolutely. Who, anyone who follows me on Instagram knows him. That, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. We, I, I should say, we both worked with Brad on yes. For the People. Yes. And, That's uh, how I met him. I, I enjoyed working with him. He's a lovely season. person. I make fun of him a lot. I joke that my social capital went up when I started dating him because people love him so much. Yeah. He is beloved everywhere. Yeah. It's annoying. It, is it? <laughs> I mean, a little bit because people are like, like, I don't know. He, like, he's never done anything wrong in his life, I guess. He's perfect. Uh, yeah, that's Brad. Yeah. <laughs> that's the Brad I remember. Yeah. <laughs> How was Paris? Um, it was good. Yeah. We were sick for uh, the first part of it, so oh, we gosh. did a lot of sleeping yeah. in Paris. Yeah. Uh, but it was it was good. We were meant to go around pa- uh, France more, but because we were sick, we just stayed in Paris. So we spent two weeks in Paris. Like, wow. What's bad about that? Nothing. Yeah. Did we go to the Louvre? We did go to the Louvre. I had been there before, but Brad hadn't, so we went on this like very short tour so he could see like the key pieces of art and then we went to a wine tasting afterwards. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, priorities. Yeah. Look, <laughs> if you were to do the Louvre every, like for 24 hours, it would take you three and a half months to see everything in the Louvre. So I feel like <sighs> let yeah. a hopped up Scotsman show you around for an hour. Yes. And then go taste some wine. You, you know what? You're absolutely right. Those museums, it starts getting... Uh, What's the word here? I'm asking a writer for, for my source right tedious. now. Tedious? Yeah, not tedious. It, it, the same thing over and over yeah. again. Repeti- almost. Repetitive. Repetitive. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Thank Michael you. is also a writer. Oh, well then. The main reason he's here on the show is being my Google sure. uh, searcher and the source. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it does get a little repetitive. I mean, you can only see the marble sculptures, you know, 50 of them. Right. Well, and they start to run together. And also, I have to say, like, our tour guide was amazing and super fun. He was like very excited to show us the art. And oh, he was cool. a Scottish expat who was like, like he was like, I have these things I'm so keen to show you. And we were all like, great. Well, we're now really keen to see them. And he like really went into detail on them. And it was just, it was a, it was a fun thing, but oh, I'm awesome. glad we saw those yeah. pieces and didn't just wander around going like, yeah, great. There's another marble lady who right. somehow lost her arms. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, another headless lady. Perfect. Uh, just a reminder, keep this kind of oh, yeah, close. Yeah. No, no, it's all good. Um, any any part of Paris that you miss, that you like a restaurant or like a little cafe? Because they're, they're just filled with... The... It's lousy with cafes. Is that yeah. bad? It, no, there are so many cafes, which I love. It's my, my favorite thing in Paris is to sit down literally anywhere at mm-hmm. like two in the afternoon, order cure after cure, and then eventually a board of cheese, and then they don't care how long you stay, so get up around 4.35 and then go continue with your evening. It's my favorite thing. But we did it, we did that most days. But there were two places I loved. One, we actually went for like a proper dinner Mm -hmm. uh, called Le Bon Georges, and it's this tiny little restaurant. The food was incredible. The owner probably knew like three out of five people who walked in the door and would sit with them and drink wine with them, and they were so kind to us, and it was just the best meal I've had in a long time. And then there was another day where we were in the um, the six arrondissement and we were just uh, wandering and we found this street that was packed with cafes and we just kind of sat at one and our server was hilarious and like Brad ordered some drink and he was like, no, 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 this one's stronger. This. <laughs> and so Brad did it because Brad was like, okay, sure. And <laughs> and Brad was immediately like, yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't kidding. He was not lying. And but the, he was just so lovely and friendly. And we sat there for a good three or four hours and just ate cheese and drank wine. And that's so great. We're relaxed in Paris. Yeah, which is unusual. And there's something great about people watching in a city you've never been in. Yeah, that was me and my buddies in Tokyo. We just sit at, sit at these. Co- uh, what's was that? I was just saying. I bet it was amazing. Oh yeah. Yeah. We'd go to these master craftsmen brewers of coffee. Yeah. which is the exact name that they had on the signs. Not kidding. And <laughs> <laughs> we would just people watch and mm-hmm. talk with, you know, the, the the baristas. And I don't know. It just, you just, you feel out of place in the best way possible. Yeah. It's, I feel like, it's funny because I went to, the last time I went to Paris, I was fresh off of a heartbreak and I was totally by myself. Oh, wow. And so this time, being with Brad, it was uh, a very different situation, obviously. But there is this sort of sense of, isolation so you almost get to feel like you're watching from inside of a box like I feel like Mm. I wasn't the first time especially because I didn't want to talk to anyone I just wanted to sort of be alone and so I would sit in this like kind of quiet place of 
isolation and watch people and experience this city. And I feel like we had a similar time, but different, if that makes it like. Yeah. So we were watching from a different through a different prism. And it was a it was a really it was fascinating to contrast the two also. Does but, this ever happen to you where you start looking at all the different like apartment buildings and buildings and you realize, oh, my gosh, wait a minute. There are people in there in each one of those rooms with yes. their own lives, their own problems, their own dreams, and it's just this one city. There's like millions of people, and then you start thinking about, oh my gosh, in the whole country of France, and then you start thinking about Europe, and then the world, and it gets overwhelming to think how many people and how many souls and how many, I don't know, people's lives, and then and, and some people are just in their own little bubble and they never reach out of it. I don't know. It's kind of overwhelming just to start thinking about it. I think about it all the time, and actually there were. Two, we passed two uh, apartments on two different nights where someone was having a party and one was having like very clearly like a dinner party and then one was just having like a party where people were sitting at the window and I was like you're gonna fall out if you're not careful because I'm 100 and like <laughs> and and I kept we, we sort of said we were like they're just in Paris like for us Paris is this place we went and planned and fantasized about and for them they live there and they're in their home and they're having a party with their friends who mm. like hopefully don't fall out of the window and like I think about that all the time how the people's lives are different what their stories are what's happening for them in that moment what brought them there because we met a lot of expats too and like what mm. brings you to that place what gets you to want to leave your life or to not leave your life it was I think about it constantly we romanticize things a lot as humans oh yeah Absolutely. Whenever I get the things I've been really working for or really want, it's never exactly the same for me. No. Not to say I'm not appreciative or anything like that, but I'm like, oh, for instance, my first guest spot I ever booked was on The Mentalist. And I was like, when I heard, got the phone call, I was like, yes, yeah. yes, there's no fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. imagined there would be fireworks <laughs> for this. So... Yeah, it's just never the same. I wonder why we do that as humans. I mean, I think we all want, you all kind of, we all kind of imagine what something is going to be like. I was also on The Mentalist, so it's funny. I wonder. Yeah, you're an actress too, which then I was yeah. looking up. Your, I'm, I, I see you as, oh, Celia the writer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I pretty much am now. But I, it's just like, but I remember my first guest spot, kind of actually, uh, it was on House. Mm. And I didn't have an agent at the time. I just... I knew the casting director from New York. And so she called me in and she called me. I was on my way to Chicago, circling back to that, like the things that are meant for you are for mm. you. Like I was on my way out of town. So it was just nice. It just fits so nicely that like I had my audition. She called me. I went to Chicago. I came back to a job. But she called and I and she told me and I started crying. And I, I did sort of have this thing like I, I have to get on a plane now. Like, don't you guys know that I just reached a, a huge milestone in my career and now I have to get on a, it, it? It is sort of this weird, um, I don't know. I, I feel like we imagine what it will all feel like and then it doesn't uh, feel like that. Yeah. I will say, uh, for the people, felt more magical than I anticipated when I started that, which I did not, I don't know if some of that was just having been through the, a rough career period before and just being so grateful to have something. Yeah. Or if it was also the chemistry of the show or some mix of the two, but you're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, it was you. Uh, it was our conversation about washing machines. That yeah. really, like, oh yes. Turned it on its Dude. Mm -hmm. That was adult conversation, conversation yeah. at its best. Came in, came into set excited. And <laughs> I, I felt like such a loser. I was like, he's going to think I'm the weirdest. Like, <laughs> I was excited to talk to someone. I was just to trying some... to be cool, and yeah. then I'm like, we just had this very long conversation about la laundry and washing machines. I was like, cool, I'm a, I'm an idiot. No, I didn't think that. I was like, somebody gets it. <laughs> and then when I got my new washer and dryer, which by the way was an incredible experience, yeah, just getting that. Sure. And I was like, this is mine. Nobody's washed their clothes in this yet. Just me. <laughs> and you don't even have to. Well, you do have to pay for it. That's not I did pay yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty, I pretty petty. <laughs> coins, but you know, anyway, whatever. And, and then I, I was telling you, like, I think a week later, I was like, hey, <laughs> Celia, you know about fabric softener? <laughs> I'd never used fabric softener before. It blew my mind. Do you use the liquid or the sheets? Liquid. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's the uh, all-natural stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. 
I grew up on sheets. I grew up uh, in a uh, small town in yeah. the Panhandle of Florida. Okay. I feel like that what you gotta do? why I <laughs> use sheets. I don't know why that was important for you to know. So what was so what was that transition from acting? Because you actually have a good number of credits acting. Yeah. Uh, to writing. Well, I was act. I. I always wanted to be an actor. It's all I ever wanted to be. Mm. And then moved to New York, and it just wasn't working for me. So I came here, and I worked pretty early and pretty steadily, and then I injured my back uh, it, doing nothing. I literally woke up and couldn't move one day. Whoa. And I spent two weeks in the hospital, and I um, ha- had surgery. And I, and I did go back to work right afterwards uh, on a show, and then – re-injured my back so I couldn't work for a while and I I got super depressed and I developed an anxiety disorder and I couldn't I could truly like barely function whoa and I started writing just to keep myself upright and um and I wrote about the first thing I wrote was this I was in a writers and actors group where we would writers would bring in 10 pages of whatever they were working on and we would perform them and then an uh um we had a we had something called theme night every quarter, and on this theme night, the actors wrote scenes and put writers in the scenes. So I wrote this scene that was about um, being depressed and having your life turned upside down. And uh, someone came up to me afterwards, and they were like, "You should keep going. That's a that's a that's a pilot. You should keep going." And so mm-hmm. I wrote it, and um, wasn't really working as an actor. Like, didn't work as an actor for a while, like maybe a couple years at that point. Wow. And I. So one night I was working like three different jobs and I was broke and I decided to um, enter it in a competition, that pilot that I wrote. And then it placed in like, I entered it in three pilot competitions and then there was a feature version as well and I entered that in the nickel. And it was a quarter finalist or a semi-finalist in all of them. And I just really wanted to see if it was any good or if I was any good. And having it placed ended up getting me an agent and... Um, and then they seemed to be like, yeah, you're a writer. You're going to do this. And I was like, I don't know if you're <laughs> right about that. I don't think so. I think I just wrote this one thing and you, for whatever reason, like it, but I don't know. And so it's been this process of like, oh, I guess I am a writer. And then they took me through like a mini development process to see if I actually could write. <laughs> and yeah. I wrote a second script and then wrote a couple more pilots. And now I'm more of a writer than I am an actor. I I would miss acting. Like I would love to do it. I I saw um, I saw Burn This in New York while I was there recently, and all I wanted to do was get on stage and play with Adam Driver. And I was like, oh, I guess I miss acting more than I thought. But yeah. but for the most part, I'm a writer now, and that's what I do. And it's yeah. been an interesting. It's been interesting to to feel comfortable calling myself a writer, and not to feel like this is all a big mistake, and um, an accident. I've had to like really change my way of thinking to being like mm. oh I'm an accidental writer to like no I'm a, I'm a writer and I deserve where I am and I'm I I am allowed to be here and I, and I belong here absolutely that's um, so good that you can say that to yourself it's taken a long time I'm yeah still I mean like I it's still a little bit strange I find myself in meetings sometimes defaulting to that like I don't know it's an accident and then I have to remind myself that like no I I this is my job and I, I'm a full-time writer you know, I think it's hard for anybody to imagine themselves something other than what they've been for years and years and years. I mean, look yeah. at kid, kids, you yeah. know. Eventually with time, you realize one day you're like, oh, wait, I'm like 14. I'm not a kid anymore. Right. And then one day you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa I'm 22. I'm definitely not a kid anymore. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not a teenager anymore. Yeah. And it just starts like, whoa. I'm having a normal conversation about cholesterol and washing machines. I- exactly. Yeah. yeah. So – I think for most artists, it's so important for them to, hey, you got to try a whole bunch of things, okay? Don't let this one thing define you, you know, especially with creatives. There is plenty of things to be creative with. And I think with anything that involves money or a career or a business, there's going to be those pros and cons to it. That's what you have to deal with Mm -hmm. constantly. I mean, look at acting. Yes. When it's good, it's good. When it's yeah. bad, it sucks it's horrible. So bad. <laughs> but even when it's good, you still have to deal with yeah. Well, the bad things. It's this interesting. There's never an end. Uh, there's never an end point as an actor. There's never a point where you go like, okay, I feel like I have reached 
the pinnacle or uh, reached my goals. I think the goals always uh, get bigger. There's the next thing, and what's the next yeah. thing? And am I going to work again? I don't know. If, I, I mean, I think most actors I know and all writers I know <laughs> have this fear of like, this is it. This is the last time I'm ever going to work. And I, and I think, um, I think uh, we have to get sort of comfortable in that space. Hundred percent of you know. It, try, like you said, trying so many things and trying to find a bunch of different ways to satisfy yourself. Because if this is the only way, or you, or this is the only way you define success, uh, you're going to be so sad. Absolutely. Because you're, it's never going to be enough. I don't. I can only speak for myself. For me, I can't see a point where I'm going to go. Yes, like I'm satisfied. You know. It, uh, yeah. I don't even think Shonda feels that way. Like, no. I think it, after, I mean, what was it? I think after two days of me not doing anything, I'm like, all right, <laughs> let's yeah. get let's get another job. Yeah. Let me call my agent, see what's going on. Yeah. What can I do better? What yeah. can I, you know? I, I definitely feel that there's something. I don't know. It's this. It's it'll be there forever. I have no clue what it is. Are we striving for something? Are we always just wanting to express ourselves in some way? Maybe just experiencing life. That's also another important thing of why I think artists should try everything is because how can you reflect life if you're just living mm-hmm. in one small corner of it? You have to go away. I, th- I mean, like, f- for me, travel is the way I do that. Like, mm. uh, I've done a lot of a fair amount of traveling, and I, for me, it's about being outside of what's comfortable for me. But I also think thinking about the transition of actor to writer – uh, when I was in high school and college or high school, middle school, when you had to write a poem or something, mm. I would cry and have an anxiety attack if I had to read it out loud. The thought of anyone hearing words I had written was mortifying. Yeah. So the idea that now I've seen words I wrote on television and people heard them and I'm not crying, I'm actually like really excited and proud. I don't know that I... It, it required me being an actor and exploring that part to get to this part, if that makes sense. 100%. Like, I had to be an actor first to put on other people's skin and then through that get more comfortable with my own skin mm-hmm. to now take off my skin and put it on a page. Yeah. And I think um, if I had just stuck to, like, well, I'm an actor, that's what I've wanted to be since I was 12, and I, you know, I'm a big nerd and I... Uh, I practically lived at the drama bookshop when I was 16, Uh, then I would have a very boring, um, limited life. And I think when you start to explore other parts of yourself and then, and not sort of look at it as, I don't look at it as a loss. I look at it as part of my growth. Mm. I, I miss acting sometimes, but I also know that it got me to a place where now I feel more fulfilled and capable as an artist than I did as an actor. And I feel like I wonder now what kind of actor I would be after having been a writer oh. for a while. A better one for sure. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. No. And something else to hit on, those times in your life whenever it's been turned upside down because of something tragic mm-hmm. or uh, a series of uh, un- mis- mis- unfortunate events. Not the TV show. The, uh, <laughs> the, the actual thing. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> those are... I'm immensely thankful for them, even though they were traumatizing at the time. But they, I've gained things from them that are invaluable. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, you write too, though, right? On my side, <laughs> yeah. I'm not nowhere near right. I'm trying to get better at it because I'm trying to explore that creative process. Right. It's difficult for me. Do you feel like... Um, do you write... I guess I'm wondering what I'm trying to ask. Do you write about those things that have happened to you or do you Mm. know I like I always try to think of okay this is going to get kind of personal but that's okay I always try to think what is the you know what before I say that let me take two steps backwards there's a great artist uh, his name is Alex Wright uh, Mr. Michael he does these amazing visionary paintings absolutely uh, incredible Uh, he did the album Artwork for Tool, Lateralis, uh, Alex something. Is he, is he a tattoo artist? Uh, no, no, he's not. <laughs> he is, uh, no, he's an old man. 
a church. Oh gosh, I I, I need to find this because it, it it's the whole reason I uh, I like writing about this yeah. certain thing and what I do with acting too. It basically deals with these are all tattoos. <laughs> Son of a <laughs> Alex Gray, Alex Gray, Alex Gray Cosm. Yeah, and so you'll see like some of his artwork right there. We'll pull. Oh it wow. Up. Yeah, in, in, incredible. Yeah. And so one of, yeah, there we go. Okay. These crazy trippy things. And you see this like pen. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if we can find the exact picture. We'll, we'll, I mean, at some point you'll probably see it. But he has this wonderful picture of this divine hand with like, a, like an eye in the, like the third eye giving this pen, this beautiful pen, the divine message to the painter. And I'm like, oh, whoa. Yeah, I want whatever message or story that needs to be told to the masses, to, to a certain group of people, I want that to flow through me. So whenever I, I want to write about something or whenever I act, I pray that, okay, whatever divine message from the universe, from God, wants to flow through me, let it, I, I hope I get it at the right time and I hope to receive it at the right time and able to express <clears throat> it correctly. So that's what I'm, I'm, I try to think about when I write. I'm like, okay, what story do I feel needs to be told? Yeah. I... I'm similar. I, I mean, there's a whole. I, I have a whole lot of feelings about God and religion, and mm. and but I have sort of come to this place of <clears throat> there is something that I rely on, uh, whatever that thing is, uh, sort of pushes me in the right direction. So mm. like, the harder I work, the less right something is. The more I just sit in and listen and let whatever needs to come through yes. come onto the page, the easier it is. Like there's actually a scene in For the People <laughs> that <clears throat> I was struggling. It was my, f- it was not our first set of scenes that we wrote, but like I was really struggling with it. And I was also working on set. I was also on set. I was covering the episode. So mm-hmm. my scene was due and I also had to be on set at 7 a.m. So I came to the office at like five and I sat in my office and I was struggling and struggling. And then finally I was like, what do I want to say? What, mm. what is the thing that I want to say? And I'll just put the words in this character's mouth. And it just flowed out. And I cried the whole time it was coming out. And it just flowed out. And it made it to air almost exactly the same way that I had written it. Wow. And it was such a, and it was the first one that I saw being filmed. So I went down to set and I remember watching it being filmed. And I remember someone said, um, how did that, how'd you write that or whatever? And I was like, it just, just came out. I, I, I didn't think it wasn't one of those things where I like labored over it. And there are moments where I do labor over things. And I, I think that's part of the process. But in that moment, I just remember thinking when I write what's true, it's easy and it comes through me. Mm. And that's what resonates for people. And so I think that's how you have to work as an actor, writer, any creative. I think you just have to let what's true come out of you. Absolutely. Because when we try to like craft it, I think we lose what's resonant. I'm right. Fleabag is like constantly in my mind and I feel like part of it is because it's so true. Right. I watched the second season this mm. week and just writing truth and it, Truth comes in a lot of forms. I mean, science fiction, horror, all those things. But, like, that's why um, it should feel easy, right. I think. I, th- I, do, I don't want our uh, – I, I want to clarify. I think – and I don't think that's what you mean, but craft, I believe, is important. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely, yes. absolutely. absolutely. I don't think you can just be like, exactly. uh, and call yourself a genius. I think you also have to learn your technique and your craft. And I think when you're, when you're comfortable with your truth – and you have your craft, mm. that's when you are really in the sweet spot, oh, I think. Oh, yes. yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I don't want to dismiss craft ever. No, no, yeah, I just wanted to clarify yeah. that, but I, I think artificially trying to manufacture a moment, yeah. even for actors, you know, as you know, it's like, wait a minute, this isn't working. Why isn't this working? Let's go back to the script. What does it say? Okay, let's work off the structure. The, the script is good. We know the script is good. Why isn't this working for me? Oh, that's right. I, 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 it's not important. The stakes aren't high enough. Or you know what? Let's pick up the pacing. We're right. like slow with this for some reason. And once you figure those things out, again, that goes back to technique. Totally. You can't learn that stuff without having to go through no. the acting class, which no. is like 
in the beginning, looking back at acting class, I'm like, oh, God, I must have been, like, the worst actor <laughs> oh my God. in the entire world. You know what I mean? Because you're, like, learning pacing yeah. for, like, three weeks. You don't know what pacing is. And then one day, you're like, oh, y- the cues. Like, right. it's not saying it faster. <laughs> right. It's, it's just, like, pic- just be, yeah. 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 And then the first time, by the way, I was taking a Meisner class, and the concept of actually listening yeah. to my partner, and I'm like, Oh, I'm a piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what kind of actor am I? <laughs> I remember I was 21 and I was doing this summer program at the public. And I had, like, come from, like, you know, I had done high school theater. So I was, like, real hot shit in high school. Yeah. And I'm doing this program at the public. And I was, like, doing the same thing I always did in school. Like, just, like, you know, I show up with my lines and I'm, like, we'll just see what happens. <laughs> And my teacher pushed me and pushed me and pushed me until I had, like, reached some sort of emotional, like, just, like, cracking. Mm -hmm. And he was like, if you don't come in with that level of readiness, emotional readiness every day, I will stop working with you. Good. He was like, I'm kicking you out. And I was like, oh, shit, this is what it means to be a professional. And Mm -hmm. it was the first time I understood what being ready and being a professional was. Um... And it really knocked me on my ass because I was like, oh, this is how it means. This is how you actually have to show up. Those are the best moments for any working craftsman of any type. I was so depressed that night. And, you know, however many years later, uh, however many years later, I'm like. Right. Sorry. I think we did did our mics cut out. For a second. For a second. It's okay. Yeah. I don't know what happened. We got to take a quick break anyway. We'll uh, double check on the stuff, but uh, we'll be right back. Well, peacefully at home in my bed. <laughs> if you're still with us, we're talk- <laughs> talking about places we'd like to die. Yeah. And for me, Nara, Nara, Japan. I'll die there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now I want to go there just to see where you'll die. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Okay. It's a deer just roam around, friendly deer. You feed them, you pet them. It's beautiful. Did you camp there? Is it a camping? Like, no, it's a it's city. Just a it's city. A, like okay. a small town. It's beautiful. That's amazing. Temples, biggest Buddha structure. Wow. Yeah, it's beautiful. Now I want to die there. It's 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 <laughs> heaven on earth for me. Beautiful it's, parks, it green, lovely people. The deer bow to you so they can get treats. Ah, what? That's the sweetest thing I've ever heard. Oh, man. It was a dream come true. And my friend is terrified of animals. <laughs> so watching him <laughs> That's deal with part. that. Oh, yeah. He's terrified of deer? Yes, any animal. Squirrels. I am not exaggerating. If a bird flew like where those lightings lightings are, he would be like, oh, oh. Anyway, every single time we meet up for coffee, it's like that. Why? Yeah. Why? He just has a thing with animals. What He's if, scared of them. I want to hug him because it's really sad. D- don't hug him. <laughs> don't, don't hug him. Uh, and f- for those listening, it's Jante. Of course, it's Jante <laughs> Lagrasse. <laughs> Um, we were golfing at a driving range and by the way, we're at a driving range, uh, here in Burbank Mm -hmm. and we're just, you know, shooting things and a deer comes up about like maybe 50 yards and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) I'm like, dude, let's calm down. It's a deer. He's like, it has antlers. I'm like, I'm aware. (laughs) I'm completely aware it has antlers. This deer was fearless. And so it started getting closer and closer and <laughs> it hangs out of the driving range. What does it have to fear? Yeah, and he just was like so uncomfortable that he like turned away. He's like, don't make eye contact. <laughs> and I'm like, it's a deer. We That's are amazing. the alpha. And then like, we made a noise and it scurried off. And I'm like, come on, Jante. That's, that's yeah. pathetic. I, <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> he, uh, I texted him. I did a story. Did you see my story the other day? Which one? Where I was crying and talking about I'm really worried about my friend John Taylor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then he was, I was like, he's on Barstool Sports. And it was just some crazy guy in the subway. Yeah. And he, <laughs> he just had like a, a a mask on. He was just being weird. It was like some cra- crazy homeless guy. Yeah. And I tagged him as, that's him. Please pray for him or something. And he just responds back. He's like, you're a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, you should the 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 hiking uh, prank. Hiking prank. Which one was when that? His, when his when his mom. Oh yeah, I forgot about this one. So his mom came to visit. Mm-hmm. This shows you how much of a great friend I am. <laughs> 
his mom came to visit with I think a couple other with her, fr- her friend, and he was going with him. Uh, she was going with him and his girlfriend. So I knew the hiking trail they were going on. I went earlier. And I put up signs of, have you seen this child? And it was him as a young boy, like, but missing. <laughs> yeah. And I was, this was the second part, though. I, I, that was like plan B, because plan A, and it would probably have not been so great for him, but I thought it was the funniest out of the two. Have you seen this little boy? And it's like him as a kid. Last seen with this man, and it's him currently. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been... <laughs> <laughs> what like <laughs> just watching him trying to explain that to people no no that's me that's as me. a kid, it's a kid. I... my friend's Incredible. an asshole it's not <laughs> anyway so, <clears throat> that's the kind of person I am it's good it's important to have those friends it is that I think. you want to murder like frequently yeah, yeah. Right. you gotta ruin your yeah. friend's day sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um Michael, what do we got for current events today? <clears throat> so, um, we got first, lawmakers shelve a potential remedy to the housing crisis, which is SB 50, which uh, is a bill to uh, encourage developments near uh, public transit locations and build high rises to build affordable housing. And they've canceled that. And they have, yeah, they, it's been shelved. By the people who live in that area? No, by the oh. committee that in the Senate, the California State Senate. The, the actual lawmakers. What, do they give a reason? I mean. they're just, they're just, it's a divisive bill that was just shelved until next year. S- expand the state's housing supply by forcing cities to allow apartment buildings in low-slung bungalow neighborhoods on which the state was built. We need affordable housing. Yeah, though. Like, it's the only way. <laughs> What do they expect? They're building luxury apartments everywhere, like yeah. for yeah. three grand or one bed. I'm like, hey, who's affording that? I mean, no, no one. Foreign but, investors. Uh, yeah, people who aren't here to live. I, I, it's so frustrating to me because affordable housing and um, supportive housing are the ways to end homelessness. Like full stop. That is how you do it. Mm-hmm. And the idea that we can't get it together to actually build these structures and get people in homes it infuriates me on a regular basis. I'm really, it's Where's disgusting. people's humanity? That's yeah. what, that's, uh, people just don't give, a, don't give a shit about other people. I think people give a shit when they're a comfortable distance away. Well, but when someone like, is potentially in your building or in your neighborhood, then they don't, it's, mm. it's less attractive. But okay. the truth is you have a lot homeless people have a lot more to fear from us than they do than we do from them. I mean, like, most homeless people are uh, not in that position because of anything. Yeah. Sorry. Um, sorry for our listeners. Our, uh, sorry about that. No, the, 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 the audio keeps cutting in and out, I hope. It just says can... audio may not be heard as expected. Click, click to adjust loopback settings. I've never seen this before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, brought... it's, uh, it's, it's, it's exciting the, times it's still, for it's our still, listeners. It's still being recorded. So, it's all the ghosts all right, that follow so, me. All the yeah. ghosts that follow me are Pro- yeah. messing with the electrical field. You have ghosts? <laughs> I I am joking about it, half joking. Yeah, but I do have like a weird electrical field thing. I break microwaves for no reason all the time. Whoa! Yeah, I went, I went through okay. three microwaves in a year. Uh oh. Yeah. Interesting. Anyway, but homeless most, people. Homeless are, people. <laughs> The whole, thing, the, the, whole, the whole thing is between, like, yep. yimbies and nimbies, which yeah. is not in my backyard and yes in my backyard because it's yeah. – so. Yeah. I don't know the solution to it, but, like, from what you're saying, affordable housing will help tremendously. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have all the facts available to me, mm. but I do know that – I believe it's in Utah. There's a city in Utah that eliminated their homeless pro- problem or mostly eliminated it by um, – providing supportive housing to people. So giving people housing for a year, allowing them to get on their feet and then helping them find work Mm. can literally like eradicate homelessness because it's not about, it's about not being able to get ahead. It's about not being able to find a job if you don't have an address, if you don't have an address. How do you shower and go to work? How do you, how do you live your life if you don't have a home? And so when you start with a home as opposed to sort of forcing people to do it a different, you know, the opposite way, um, you're much more able to build a life for yourself. Yeah, it's happening in Pasadena. There are a couple of places in Pasadena that have these um, that have these programs, and it's made worlds of difference in so many families' lives. Wow. 
Pretty you know, amazing. something I learned from Japan is this. I was astounded by the quality of service that I got. We got everywhere. Like the best service I've ever received in America was a normal service in, in like a restaurant, a coffee shop, wherever. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about people in like the 7-Elevens. I mean, they had such pride and discipline and diligence with the, how they wanted to help you and they were so kind. And I wish there was some way to get people to feel like that, like our culture to adopt that aspect of it. Because like, you know, sorry to say, sometimes you'll go and, you know, grab something from a, <clears throat> I don't know, grocery store and the person ringing you out is like, I get it, they're having a bad day and stuff, but like maybe they're just rude or they're, they don't want to like help bag the groceries c correctly, you know? Right. There's not that like, I don't know the, I know, I know the Arabic word for it, but I don't know the English word, like this like fire underneath you to like, come on, let's... Drive. You're at your drive. You're, yeah. yeah, this drive. drive. Yeah, like, <laughs> I don't know. I wish we could adopt something like that. That way can, people can feel proud about even any job they do and we can respect any job that there is because it needs to be done and we can create jobs. I hate when people say, well, there's just not enough jobs. It's like, no, you can create jobs. There's, there's stuff to be done. Well, I also think it's about, I mean, <clears throat> it's about giving people a baseline. So if you have a, if you're being paid a living wage, if mm -hmm. you're being given basic human respect, if you're being treated with basic human dignity, then you're much more likely to sort of go into your job and feel proud of yourself and feel like you want to, um, yeah, you want to excel, right? But if you're being paid, you know, uh, some garbage amount of money and someone's treating you like shit and you are, you know, worried that like you're not going to be able to pay for your gas later on. I think it's much harder. I mean, I, you know, there was a point in my life where I was working literally three jobs. I was working retail and I was working as an assistant and I was working like a an at-home like copywriting job. And there were many months when I wasn't sure I was going to – I knew I could make my rent, but I wasn't sure if I could make everything else. And so the minute someone came to me with like even just like a flash of kind of rudeness, I would be like, fuck you. Right. And – I think it was because I was living in this heightened state of anxiety. And I feel like I, I admittedly, shamefully, do not know much about Japan um, and their infrastructure. But, like, I do believe here so much sorry, of this. Sorry, that was my stomach, okay. by the way. I haven't, I haven't <laughs> caught that. Like, I have a muffin in my bag. <laughs> I'm so hungry right now. It's ridiculous. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. We have some, we have some bars outside. <laughs> I might need to eat that, guys. <laughs> that it's still the ghost. skydive jump from earlier really did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hungry. This is why you can't go into the atmosphere without a proper breakfast. That's 100% <laughs> true. <laughs> there's, um, a, there's an interesting book. It's called uh, A Generation of Sociopaths, which talks about how basically the baby boomers are just this, just sociopaths, basically. Like, they are so, like, greedy and they don't mm. share this, like, general uh, thought to, like, you know, we are all in this together. And they're very yeah. selfish. Mm. It's a very interesting book. I'm curious to read it. But yeah, I mean, I, I feel so much like hmm. when we're not saddled with anxiety about paying our bills, paying, our, paying for our health care, functioning on a daily basis, we're much more able to be creative and open and, con and, and, and when, we, when we have that, if we ever have that, I think we'll be a better, in a better place. Yeah, I think yeah. my perspective on it is there's a reason why certain people are kept in their socioeconomic bubble. Yeah. And that's control. Yeah. It's easier to keep people poor and unhealthy mm -hmm. than it is to let them, yeah. Yeah, and that's why I think it's their... – exactly. I think, and also I think that's why it's so important with art to be very careful on what you're putting out there to the masses, mm -hmm. especially with music. I'm going to sound at first like a grumpy old man, but hear me out first, okay? I like certain types of rap that talk about, like, the the heartache and the, the actual struggle of, like, growing up with, like, no money in a neighborhood that's very dangerous. Like, the actual, like, Kendrick Lamar talks about that. Mm -hmm. Uh uh, Eminem, Jay Z, you know, like certain songs are just like, oh, whoa, like you, you, I read the lyrics, I'm like, man, that's like poetry. And then you have these other songs which like glorify spending thousands and, and, and hundreds of thousands of dollars on a chain, chain necklace just so you can look 
better than the other person. It's like, that's not helping people get out of their struggles and not moving forward. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it happens with other types of music as well. I, and I, I, I don't know. I, I, it just bothers me because it's like you can be giving back to your community. You can be giving so much more help to the people because you're out of it now. The best thing you could do is try to get more people out. Anyway, I, I, I don't know how to solve this problem. I mean, just stop listening to that music or stop. Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm not smart enough to I know that there's a problem, though. I also, I, I mean, I, I also wonder, like, what uh, what those uh, artists are doing in their personal lives. I think, mm. you know, your art doesn't necessarily, um, this is a, uh, I think sometimes as a writer, like, what I'm writing, for me, usually has to have purpose. But I also think in my life, even if I'm writing something that is, like, a very stupid comedy, I'm also constantly trying to make someone's life better privately right. if that makes sense so i don't know what those artists if they're singing about like you know buying 10 houses are they also paying someone's medical bills for them privately mm -hmm. and we don't know about that i think sometimes it's hard to know who someone is just through their art absolutely uh, yeah but sometimes i mean it's yeah you got a pretty <laughs> sometimes good, you're like we got social media now and they're like, oh <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> yeah wouldn't no. want to grab coffee with there you are, anytime soon yeah. no there are some people where i'm like we would never be friends yeah yeah for sure. Uh, and the flip side to that is also like certain TV shows, which I, I get are meant for entertainment. I think mm -hmm. entertainment is very important. You can't just yeah. be shoving or preaching to people constantly. Right. And people will just tune out. So it's important to have that balance at the same time. I don't know. I hope things get better. Did sure. we even address the homeless crisis? I, I uh, mean, we fixed it. We fixed it. <laughs> we fixed it. <laughs> we fixed it. See, it's okay, ghosts. Yeah, it's it's go <laughs> yeah, that's Ghosts will help us. Next what? up is 414 million pieces of plastic found on remote island group in the Indian Ocean. Oh, wow. I just read something. Uh, uh, two women just made something that basically dissolves, biodeg biodegrades plastic into uh, oil or something, into an, like a usable substance. Wow. Yeah. Like basically solving the plastic in the oceans problem. Like so many whales have washed up too. With yeah, a bunch of plastic in their stomachs. Uh, I think I, I feel like I read about some turtles who yeah. died also because of plastic recently. The, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, just all this, all on the beach. Jeez. <sighs> Including nine hundred and seventy-seven thousand shoes. Ah. Uh, wow. Dude, I don't know. Like, this world just seems like it's just constantly getting worse. Yeah. And worse. Do you recycle? Uh, huh? I do recycle, Good. and I, I, what's that? Hmm? I was just curious how much they had donated. Oh. Sure. Oh, okay. Good to know. Um. Or, uh, yeah, do you, uh, you recycle? I recycle. I, uh, I didn't know that plastic straws were such an issue, mm -hmm. and our, our, um, our showrunner's assistant, Marina, on For the People, used to talk to us about straws every day. So I oh, try wow. to avoid plastic straws frequently, but I also know that's a, um, Straws are important for people with disabilities, so I feel like oh. there has to be a happy medium. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know why that made of... me laugh. <laughs> well, because <laughs> I was just like, by the way, I'm just going to throw a little social issue at you. But yeah. like, but it's true, which I didn't, I feel like, um, I just feel like I'm constantly like, I'm just going to, just, I'm just going to shut up and listen. <laughs> yeah. Because I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about most of the time. But so, so I have been trying to eliminate plastic straws. Um, but also I've been a m vegetarian for most of my life. So there's a m little bit of moral superiority where I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm not eating beef, you guys. So yeah, this girl, <laughs> so. well, I've, I, I think finding a balance yeah. with whatever you do, like for instance, if I am going to our, our local uh, coffee shop, which I, I like going to that one. <laughs> this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's not, I, I have my guac, guaya key first though. Before I go to that coffee shop, <laughs> I'm drinking. I'm drinking both. Yeah, yeah. So that's the way we do it here. Um, I won't use a lid, for instance. If I'm like, I don't need a lid. I live dangerously. It's gonna spill. It's gonna spill. I mean, that's that takes courage. I am nominated for some courageous award. Sure. What is, what is it called? The no, never mind. I'm definitely not gonna go down that route. <laughs> Definitely get some hate mail. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, next week will be a lot different checking our uh, listener questions. <laughs> uh, what do, now what I'm else? afraid. Yeah, right. Uh, what else do we got, Michael? 
I have uh, the doctored Pelosi videos offer a warning. The internet isn't ready for 2020. What? Have you seen this? I have not watched it. I know about it, okay. but I haven't watched it. So it's it's a, yeah, like a slow slowed down, it down yeah. Yeah, version of... Uh, Making her sound drunk. Right. Yeah, and I'm like, uh, that's that's what we're going for now? I mean... <laughs> maybe, you know, just maybe the guy who, you know, can't speak English shouldn't, you know, comment on, on any other person's, you know... <laughs> Great. Speech, speech, <laughs> speech patterns. <laughs> can't say or in origins. Yeah. I don't know, man. Although there was a there was a funny Onion article where it says uh, Nancy Pelosi slams edited footage with claim that when she's drunk you'll fucking know it. <laughs> that's very funny. I mean, I'm not surprised that they're doing this. That that's the that's the sad part. Like it doesn't surprise me at all. It doesn't surprise me that certain platforms aren't taking it off. It doesn't surprise me that the president is retweeting it. Like. I wish I could be surprised. I miss being surprised by mm. terrible behavior. I miss actual debate. Yeah. Where they talk about the subject that they're debating and not about each other. It's like, sure. oh, oh. Well, I miss when the subject was actually up for debate. Like, I feel like now it's no longer about policy. It's not about, like, higher taxes or lower taxes. It's, like, basic moral differences. Uh, and <sighs> I can no longer, I can no longer have a conversation with certain people because I'm like, we're just... You're, you don't believe that certain people's rights are fundamental, so I don't know where we have to go from there. Like, yeah. if you don't believe that a trans person has the right to exist, then I'm just, we're not, we don't have a conversation. Like, we just don't have one. And, and, and it's, that's, I don't, I, I'm happy to debate issues, but I'm not going to debate the existence of human beings or their basic mm. human rights. That's not up for debate to me. Uh, I, 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 I am with you on the same page of everybody deserves basic human rights that's just common human sure. decency right you can't force your own political or religious views just and make somebody less of a human just because you think so you, right. you can't you just can't do that i am however and it's difficult to do but i i want to keep the the debate and the the opportunity for conversation always open because i feel so many times now people are uh, not not let's say this issue, but mm -hmm. like silly stuff like with politics. Nope, you're on a different right. political side. I'm not gonna even talk to you. It's like no, you that's you have to, otherwise we'll get nowhere, and it causes even more of a divide. We have to like continuously talk and and debate. But I feel like sometimes one side shuts down or the other side shuts down, and it's hard talking with. And at the same time, it's hard talking with somebody who is so ingrained in their views on something so basic. I mean. I, how do you change people's minds, do you think, with, with somebody like that? I mean, I don't think – I think the first way to do it is exposure. I think mm. so much of the ideas about people and what they, what they are like is about not knowing them, right? So, right. So, and I mean, going back to – our responsibilities as artists, I, you know, I believe television, I, this I have this conversation with another writer friend of mine all mm. the time, I believe television is the single most normalizing force in the world. And I believe when you have the power to create characters on television, that's, ha that's a way, that's not the way, but that is a way mm. to put people who, um, to pe put trans people in roles of, <clears throat> you know, Roles that have nothing to do with trauma or 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 um, or being defined by that aspect of their personality, casting you know casting a person of color as the person as the nationality or ethnicity that they are, um, and also putting a person in a hijab who's also a, a lawyer or a, a post office worker or something. It's not yeah. not a terrorist. Like I believe that exposure is the first way to change right. minds. I believe that there are some people's whose minds you're never going to change and you have to preserve your own emotional health and your right. own mental health and not try and work that hard. I also think you it's the job, from my perspective, I would rather lift up the people who are doing the work and the people who are really interested in um, making things better than trying to fight people who yeah. are stuck in their in their place. I'm happy to have a conversation with someone if they want to um, 
if they want to have a conversation, but I'm just not going to mm-hmm. like I'm from I'm from a small town in the south. So whenever I go back and visit, there's a lot of like um well, look at your IRA. And I'm like, "Well, I don't have an IRA." Yeah. <laughs> but like there's no amount of money that makes what's happening right now for me okay. And if your argument is look at your IRA or look at your bank account, I I don't know that I want to have that much of a conversation with you. I will usually yeah. say that's not my barometer mm-hmm. of what good is or what the what the world is that I want it to be, that I want it to look like. And if someone's open to a conversation, I'll have one, but but I'm not I'm just not trying to change people's minds who don't want to change minds. Right. I'm much more interested in lifting up the people who are doing work and 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 on our are in pain and and either doing that through my art if I can if I'm fortunate enough to do that or just through my own personal life and like what mm-hmm. I, you know when I have funds and time and and things like that right. that I can use but I don't know I I don't know that I don't even know I think you nailed it on the head though to be honest with you the fact that you can't change another person who doesn't want to change that's just common law yeah. you know you can't force somebody into changing that <laughs> you can't do that but it is like you said I, you know keeping that line of communication open is always important because you never know what happens one day one day that person might go oh wait a minute uh, okay let me talk wait a minute let's talk again well, how exactly you know what i mean yeah um and again exposure i think is very is crucial and it's again be- going back to the stories we want to tell what's important mm-hmm. what divine message should be told right now what can be told because sometimes you might receive a, a story or a message that might not resonate with you right now but later on it resonates with you yeah. and that's also important too yeah so well, and, and I, th- I mean like I also think I don't know I was just gonna say there's something I'm working on right now that hmm. came to me in a not came to me but like I started thinking about it as like a oh cool historical sort of thing and like also it would require me to go live in France for a year to work and that seemed really attractive and then once I started the research on it I realized actually it's so parallel to what's happening right now Mm -hmm. and um, during my research in Paris while I was there I I went to this one place where this there's a a march that happened um, on Versailles so a bunch of women ransacked the city hall in Paris and stole weapons and then marched to Versailles to confront the king brought the king back king never went back to Versailles turned the French Revolution on its uh, on its ear in, a, in many ways. And I was stu- standing in this courtyard of the city hall where, like, at that point, maybe six or 7,000 people had amassed ready to go march on Versailles. And the French Revolution was... It shifted a lot of ideas, but ultimately it just led to more um, terror a few years down the road, and then uh, the monarchy was reinstalled later so there are lots of like arguments as to whether it was useful right Mm -hmm. but and those women didn't know that at the time when they marched like they didn't know whether or not it would end well they just needed to get food and here I am almost three four hundred years later crying standing there imagining them begging the king to listen to them yeah so that they could eat bread and and I don't know what's going to happen next. None of us does. But I know that maybe in three or four hundred years, whatever like whatever humans have evolved to to survive climate change, w- it will matter to them, our fight, right? So I, that's why I think it's important to be writing these stories, whether we're going backwards or forwards or writing new stories or personal stories. We have to be telling these stories so that people know that Better is possible, change is possible, and even if it doesn't work out exactly how we want, it matters. Absolutely. I don't know if it's just me babbling, but no, but, no, no. I, I'm but telling I, you. But like the 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 feeling of this like the art we create, I feel really strongly that the art we create is how, at least for me, that's how I feel like I have the power to change things. So yeah. when I'm writing a character, I know what I want that person to look like. I know what I want this story to be. I feel really strongly about it. I, you know, how I want it to be cast. I think about all of those things because all of that matters to some kid who's watching the the show, hopefully, that makes it to air. Absolutely. Um, 
the, these kind of conversations are so important. That's why I, one of the reasons I love doing this radio show is because we need to keep talking about this kind of stuff. I'm not the best at articulating my thoughts sometimes. <laughs> and no, no, uh, I'm, I'm being dead serious. Like yeah. without hearing your perspective on things that uh, it, I, it won't allow me to see a little, things a little brighter, a little wider, right. you know, from a different perspective. I mean, these are so crucial to not only for us to talk about, but also for our listeners to listen to and just to keep that, again, that line of communication open. Keep Just keep your mind open. You don't have to agree with everything, you know? That's the thing too. People think like, oh, just... Now I got to agree with everything. Like people who are like on a super right. conservative level. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not, that's not the thing. That's not what the issue is. Um, we've, I, I know we're going to hit it. We're, we're, we'll continue talking about this, but we're going to, we got to take a quick break and then uh, we'll be right back. Boom. Uh. I just want to apologize to our listeners if you hear <laughs> the sounds of whales uh, gargling. They're not whales, <laughs> and they're not gargling. That's my stomach begging me for food. So apologies. But you won't give it to. We no, seem, we seem it's going to gonna listen hero. to me. <laughs> I. It's my stomach. Yeah. No. It's not my stomach. <laughs> You're in control body. of your stomach. There you go. Yeah. Um, okay. There is a problem going on with writers and agents currently in the industry, correct? I hadn't heard. You hadn't heard? <laughs> <laughs> For yes. our listeners, is there a way you can describe to us what's going on in a very simple way, what's going on? Um, I'll do my best. Okay. So the WGA is the guild, the union for writers. The ATA is the association that most agencies are part of. Not every agency is. But we, the WGA has a franchise agreement with the ATA. Um, and, um, and it hasn't been negotiated in, I believe f over 40 years, 40, 40. late, late seventies. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So yeah, please correct me on any facts if I'm missing any, anything. Cause I, 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 I am a, I've only been a member of the WGA for two years. I joined because of for the people. So I'm, I wasn't aware that this was such a pressing issue until this has, this happened. So, um, but so about, a year and a half ago, the WGA sent notice to the ATA that they would be renegotiating this agreement and that packaging in particular would be that they wanted to eliminate packaging fees, which are fees that agencies charge studios. It comes out of each episode's budget um, for – so it's normal for an agency to package, to say, like, I have this writer and I have this director. I'm putting them together. But what has happened now is that agencies are being paid fees on top of that for that for what's a normal part of being an agent. And so any, I think it's upwards of like- 30 to $75,000 yeah. an episode. Are, it's coming off the top of the budget, of the episode's budget, right into the agency's pocket. <clears throat> and they get that in perpetuity. Right, whether whether, uh, the, sh whether the showrunner, whatever client they had works on the show in, per in forever, they make that money forever. Huh. So agencies, their function is to be our fiduciaries. Their function is to like negotiate our deal. They make 10% off of what we make. It's insane for them to be making that level of money when we may not even be on that show anymore after a certain amount of time. So it's led to a lot of conflicts. There are lots of stories. If you want to Google, there are plenty of stories that you can see of writers saying that um, – you know, uh, because also what happens with the packaging is that agencies tend not to take commission. So so certain writers don't get put up for jobs because the agency knows they're already making money off of the show. They don't need to put writers up for the job. So some agencies aren't putting writers up. Some agencies are um, not pushing as hard for mm. particular work. So it's a very complicated – I highly recommend if you're interested in it just Googling um, – and reading, there are there are articles from all kinds of different different perspectives. I've found that um, uh, Variety has had a good one, has had a couple good ones, and I also just think like Twitter writers right. talking about their issues. Uh, Mike Scully had a great thread about how it affected him. Um, so David I, Shore had an yeah, entire David letter Shore. based on his his the <laughs> adaptation of his book from CAA 
when he found out about it, he demanded that they never package anything of his again. Which, and and so, like, that's been the, now that's sort of the crux of the argument is, like, some agencies are saying, well, we won't package if you don't want us to. But some writers have the power to ask for that and some don't. And some, and there's, like, just, there are a lot of questions around whether or not that is a viable option. Right. And, uh so we voted, I think it's 93%. Yeah, it was up like low was, 90s. Yeah, uh, 93% to leave our agents. So we all, um, not we all, but majority of writers have left their agents. The, wow. other, the other thing was the conflict of interest between production companies yes. that are affiliated with agencies. Yes, gotcha. so okay. agencies having production companies, them being your employer <laughs> and also your fiduciary is a major conflict of interest. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah, so those are the two core issues. There are some other issues too, but those are the two big ones and the ones that kind of caused us to leave our agents. Gotcha. So we did that, I guess it's been almost two months. Wow. And so is so, that, so you have an article right now yeah. that we're- Well, they're, they're back to the, they're, they're in negotiations to go yeah. back to the table this upcoming week. Yeah, okay. UTA sent a letter to the ATA just this week saying they want to come back to the table. So I believe it's Wednesday that they're going back. Um, I mean, we'll see. I, I I don't know. I I read that letter and I didn't really see that there was. It didn't seem like there was much different being offered, but obviously, I don't. I'm not privy to negotiations, and right. what happens in the negotiations is largely kept secret. And um, I, I I've been to many meetings, many WJ meetings. I trust our leadership. I think they're doing. Yeah. Um, I think they have our best interests at heart. It's personally, <laughs> the timing is not great <laughs> for me yeah. as a like newbie writer. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's been anxiety inducing, but I'm kind of just trying to be, uh, at peace about it and trust that it will work out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been a stressful period for sure. Well, well, I hope it works out first and foremost. I'm sure it will. I mean, I think so. It's been an interesting, I mean, you know, the WGL also filed a lawsuit against the ATA, so I don't know if it will end up playing out in uh, court. I don't know if certain it's I'm hearing rumors that certain smaller agencies are making private deals with the ATA or Verve, private deals Verve with, just did. Yeah, Verve so just signed. That Verve was like the signed, biggest lit agency that signed. Verve just signed the code of conduct. They weren't part of the ATA. So I'm curious to know if anyone who's part of the ATA will actually sign. Only one has so far and it's Pantheon. Right. No one's really, you know, knows about them. Gotcha. So it so I'm starting to wonder if 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 those deals are going to be are going to start to be made um, soon, because I think you know it's one thing for the big four; they have a bunch of different people that they are repping and making money off of. And now I know just Endeavor filed a, an IPO yesterday or something. But mid tier agencies, boutique agencies who rely on writers, I, I'm wondering if those deals will start to be made. I'm I'm hoping that some of the rumors are true. <laughs> Yeah. For selfish reasons, too. Because <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just a hard, like, r what's been amazing in this process is watching the solidarity of writers. A lot of writers, a lot of upper-level writers have reached out. And Twitter has been, like, this weird magical force for it. And it's been great. Um, but then there are also people who, d like, don't have as wide of a network. So they don't, they, it's it's harder for them to um, to reach out because you, it's hard to get read. It's hard to get people to know who you are. And and um, and so, like, for me, my agents, uh, you know, they found me from a competition. They, in my first meeting, they said, we know you're not really a professional writer. We can tell, but we believe that you have a voice. And so they helped me. And so every meeting they set up with someone for me in my early career was because they knew that that person would understand me. They knew that person would mm. be supportive of me. So I feel... Like, my agents were very um, instrumental in helping me build my career. I know other writers who don't feel that way. So yeah. I think um, right now a lot of writers are just very uh, hopeful that their agents will sign the code of conduct because we, we do care about our agents and we believe that they're doing work for us. Yeah. So it's been a, it's been an interesting staffing season, to be sure. Well, I, I'm sure, and I, first of all, I, I hope that a fair deal will yeah. come to pr play. And uh, if I know anything about this industry, people want to keep making money. Yeah. <laughs> so they'll come to an agreement at some point. Yeah. Uh, hopefully sooner than later. Yeah. So it's not going to be, I don't think, an indefinite uh, break. And that's the thing about strikes or uh, <laughs> the the warning of a strike. Nobody wants one. Nobody wants right. uh, uh, anything like that. So yeah. I, I see it hopefully by the summer. 
No. Okay. Well. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of talks that it's like two to six months, probably. Yeah, I think it I'd all depends. Oh, on end of the summer, maybe. It depends on how staffing season goes. The way that I've been looking at it is that if the writers can prove that they can create this new ecosystem without the agencies, I think the agencies will be more inclined to come back to the table to bargain. Similar, if the writer there's a hiccup and the writers can't staff, right? Then the writers will be more inclined to go back to the table to work with the agency. Gotcha. What's but your impression? It seems to me like people are staffing up. It's That sounds like it to me, yeah. Right. I mean, I so I actually, I, I work in the mailroom at ICM as oh, okay. my day job, oh. so <laughs> that's been a lot of fun. I bet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've we'll been called a, I've been I've been called a I've been called a trader at two different places, so it's oh, been fun. Jesus. When I go to the mixers, and not not in seriousness. No, no. Oh, I thought I'm like, hey, you work in the mailroom. You that's your job, so <laughs> you're not like that's where okay, all the real packaging joking, happens. Though, right? it's, it's all it's all jokes. Like, okay, my, like my my, sure. my friends that work like the 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 lit desk. They're okay, just like, yeah, yeah. trader. And then when I go to the w, WGA mixers, they're like, ah, trader. Yeah. I'm like, yep, I, I've been called that twice <laughs> on both sides or spy. <laughs> Or a spy. Whichever way you want to look at it. <laughs> but, I, I, yeah, I, I think that it does seem like they are – they're not missing a beat. So yeah. Yeah. I think there's certain things that the agencies and some of, like, the bigger agencies would like to see. Like, there's some issues with, like, the privacy mm-hmm. stuff no, that they the have. Stuff, yeah. yeah. So I think that if the WGA can come to the middle on that, I think it might be a little – Cool. It might be resolved sooner. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I'm hopeful for Wednesday. We'll see. Yeah. But I, I don't know. If they're being staffed without them, then. I mean, people get jobs without agents all the time. If people, it's not, agents are not, agents are not um, a necessity in this business, but I do think a good agent can change your whole life. Yeah. yeah. So I think maybe what this does is it, changes the way we interact with our agents the way agents operate my my understanding has always been like if i'm going to break in is that i have to get a manager first entertainment lawyer they'll help me find a job and then when i start making money then the agencies will take a look at me Mm. since i mean it depends it's so funny because it depends in my experience i just signed with a manager because of this situation i mean not just because of the situation i wanted a manager also but like this sort of like sped up the process of like because i'd been talking about managers with my agents for about six months and then because of this, it was like, all right, well, we should probably really get on this. And so um, and so I think, like, it, it just depends on your, you know, for me, my agents worked in a more managerial way. And then once I sold a show, uh, I started feeling the need to, like, bring on a manager. So, but a lot of people have lawyers for, I mean, it's just yeah. everyone's path is different. Yeah. And, and I think... Um, in general, my advice to people when they want agents is always to let them come to you. Oh, <laughs> like never to like seek out the agent because I think you have to be doing the work first and then they'll find you because mm. it's a ultimately they want to know that you can make them money. So if you're making work yeah. and you can show yeah. them that they're making money, let them come to you first. That's a good negotiating tactic. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> it's worked for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like um, I've never sought out an agent. I've always been fortunate enough to have yeah to be able to like – work and then find them. That's a very, for- I'm a for- very fortunate. I've been very fortunate in that way. That's good. Um, switch gears a little bit. Sure. You're working on something right now. Correct? I am. Yeah. I'm writing a pilot. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, f- you can't talk too much about it, right? No, I mean, I okay. don't, but it's based, I, so I used to, so one of my three jobs when I was working, <clears throat> um, before I got for the people, I was working in a sex shop and I have worked in a couple of sex shops and, um, it's uncomfortable to have me at your dinner party. I'll talk about butt plugs without provocation. Oh, goodness. And, uh, and so I've been writing a pilot based on um, uh, my experiences working in a sex shop. And oh, it's, yeah. So it's, I've been I'm excited. <laughs> Just, I hope this comes into like <laughs> full You and me both. <laughs> yeah, because I, uh, I yeah. No, I mean, I, it's something, it's speaking of the art that we, <clears throat> excuse me, the art that we make and the reasons we make things, like par- a big part of why I, wanted to write it is that working in a sex shop, uh, people have a lot of perceptions about you, a lot of people, a lot, a lot of perceptions about the people who come into those places, the people yeah. who come into these places have perceptions about themselves and what's wrong, like what might be wrong with them or whatever. And, um, and I think it's, uh, I think as a culture, we are terrified of sex, we're terrified of our own desires, mm-hmm. we're terrified of what we might want and feel. 
and we think we're alone for a lot of that and you're just not you're just not as weird as you think you are yeah. and my goal in writing the show is to um my goal always when I'm writing is to make people feel less alone. So the goal in this show is to make people feel less alone. Oh, <laughs> I it. love that. Like, that's that's wonderful. <laughs> that's all I so yeah. uh so yeah, so it's ultimately about <clears throat> the feminine feminine the power of female sexuality, the pe- the power of women and um and uh yeah, and it's uh and it's hopefully going to be funny and weird. And sad. Uh, funny, weird, and sad. That's my whole wheelhouse. <laughs> best house. combo. That's my whole wheelhouse. Uh, uh, well, best of yeah. luck with it. Thanks. I'm, Thanks. I'm really excited to see this come to Thank you. full fruition, hopefully. <laughs> now everything is loaded. Yes. <laughs> Once you start talking about sex, everything is loaded now. <laughs> full fruition. Full fruition. Yeah, why not, right? Yeah. No. And, and I, I mean, I hope so. I really, it's, it's something I believe in. I've been working on it. It's the second, it's the second idea I had to I started developing and I wrote a version of it as a spec and then we sold it as a completely different thing so like it's taken many different forms at this point yeah. and um and I feel like uh I feel very excited about the prospect of making a show like that that I think I would hope would be um uh would place the sort of like power into the hands of people who feel um who have historically felt marginalized yeah that would be my goal you know you just hit upon something whenever you're developing something or writing something uh, sometimes you have to take uh, some notes in from other uh, other people and that can be sometimes (laughs) challenging i feel like i I honestly don't know how certain writers do it because uh, i'm not even a writer and uh, if somebody were, I'm just imagining in my head, like, you know, maybe we should, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah no, we shouldn't. Okay. <laughs> like I immediately get super defensive. So that's amazing what you guys do, how you're able to really communicate in positive ways. Hopefully uh, I'm sure you do. And kind Always. of talk through things. No, cause I mean, that's what TV is. I feel like people don't realize how many people sometimes can. Yeah. I don't notes. think people know how many people are involved. Usually you have, you know, you have the, the, the writer and then you have if you're lucky enough to have a room you have a writer's room mm-hmm. and then you have um your uh network and your studio and then then actors often will have notes too or thoughts so like you have a lot of people giving you feedback and i think there are a lot of things to think about one it's interesting i just had this conversation last night with my fiance um big I like brad him. i like big brad big <laughs> beloved brad um i like using the word fiance it's weird anyway so he so so I think some of it is about depersonalizing the process. Mm. Notes are not about you nine times out of ten. Even if you're writing personally, they have nothing to do with you because no one who's in a note position, note giving position gives a shit about your feelings or your life or like why you wrote this moment because it resonated with you. Like yeah. they're not saying, right. well, the way you reacted when you were 10 to your mom yelling at you is wrong. It's like that has nothing to do. This moment is uh, – not working for them. Um, so that's the f- very first thing I think is to just like go into it with just not taking anything personally. But I also think, cause I remember I asked a bunch of people when I first started this process, I asked a bunch of showrunners the advice and I was like, when do you like take notes and what do you do? And, and one showrunner who I respect very much said, he was like, I always take a note. He was like, I, if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. But I always try to take a note because the note is always a sign that something's not working. And he said, it doesn't mean you have to take the pitch because sometimes the pitch isn't the fix. But if you find, if you take the note and you look at the note behind the note and then you try to make it work, that's you have you should always try to make it work. Right. If you can't make it work, then you can't make it work. And and there's no like there's no like note. There are always ways to say, like, sorry, this didn't work for me. But he's just said never push back on a note right away. Always do your best to take it, which I thought was really uh, smart because I think instinctively sometimes you hear something and you're like, fuck you. You just don't get it. And then you wait 24 hours and you think, "Mm, okay, now I see what that note might be. Mm -hmm. And you can find a way around it. I also think – Sometimes the pitches are the thing that you have to, the thing that maybe doesn't feel good. Like, yeah. The sometimes they'll say, well, maybe this is a fix. And then I have to usually say, maybe, but also maybe there's a different way to, 
to change this or whatever and not to get attached to the idea of like what they what they are pitching you because they're just throwing out ideas the same way you throw out ideas in a writer's room. No one's saying that has to be the thing. Uh, yeah. They're just trying to help you. So I think always just entering into it like with we all have the same intention. No one, right. no one's like making you write a script for a year to not put your show on the air. <laughs> like they want to put your show on the air because again, they want to make money. So I think going into it knowing that everyone has the goal of um, making the show the best version of itself. Uh, is an important way to go in. I also think mm -hmm. sometimes notes are very dumb. Sometimes people give very bad notes. Yeah. Sometimes people are not good at giving notes. They're not good at giving notes in a kind way or a constructive way. And I think that's where knowing your project inside and out, knowing why you wrote it, knowing yourself as a writer, knowing why you are making the choices you're making is important. Because then you can go, thank you so much for that note. Um, this is why I believe that this works better so that you always have an answer. Because I think when you don't know and you're kind of like, well, what if we did this? Or what if I just pitched this idea or whatever? <clears throat> that puts you off your game a little bit. So you're off your footing so that when a note comes in that's like, what are you talking about? You you don't have as sure a, a, a way of responding, if that makes sense. A hundred percent. I actually apply that to acting as mm -hmm. well because I received... I've received a handful of notes uh, from directors, guest directors. You know, they don't know the show inside mm -hmm. and out like we do, but I know the character inside and out. So I'm like, they'll give me a note. I'm like, hmm, okay, I, I don't mind doing that, but uh, let me, I just want to explain to you why that conflicts with a couple things. Because earlier in the script, uh, this, this, and this happened. So can you clarify as to why Jay would want to do this now? Because I'm having trouble connecting those dots. Right. And honestly, like, maybe like, a good number of those times the director goes, oh, you know, you're right. No, no, never mind. Scratch that. You're right. Just keep doing then what you're doing. And it's like, oh, cool. If I didn't know that about the character, if I didn't know my work, right. then I'm just doing, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do whatever. Right. Well, and, and nine times out of ten, I don't uh, – every, every director is different. But I've met directors that just didn't read the script or read it once and aren't as prepared as they should be. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. That is absurd yeah. to me. You are the director. Yeah. <laughs> Regardless if it's you're directing an, an episode of a television show or a full movie or a short, read the script, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's basic. So there would be times, not so much on For the People, but I've had this experience and other things where like people, I, you would have to be like, D this scene is different than you think it is, like, or whatever. So I think um, that's having an intimate knowledge of your character, of your show, of whatever, like, I was often the writer on set yeah. on For the People, and and um, and I think I had a I most of the directors I worked with were amazing. I, I only had um, like one time where I had to sort of be like, that's not really this person, and uh, and the director was receptive. It was fine, but it was just there are times where like you just have to say like I have the I have more knowledge. Yeah, I just do, and 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 and, and never in a rude way, never in an unkind way, just like. I really feel strongly that this is the better path or something like yeah, that. Yeah, which is yeah. totally fine. Yeah. Um, that's these are, this is very valuable advice here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, Good. I'm going to try and take it myself when I go home and write today right? <laughs> uh, through the tears because <laughs> I have a draft to turn in. Oh, my gosh. I've gotten uh, – this is just a side story real quick before we wrap it up. I've gotten direction from a casting director. Ooh. And there was like – it was a – not no, you think I'm going to mention the name? Absolutely not. But they were right. uh, a team, uh -huh. uh, and I could tell one, one of them was just like, "What the <laughs> hell did you just tell him to do?" Like, yeah. and I was just like, "Huh, interesting. Okay." Even though it doesn't say that in the script, you still like, like specifically. I mean, I don't. I can make it work. Sure. But she's like, "Yeah." Let's, I'm like, "Okay." And the other person was like. <laughs> 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 I feel like sometimes in casting offices, they'll just throw stuff out to see if you can hang. Yeah, know. that's this was definitely not that. Oh, okay. Yeah, that. <laughs> and by the way, if that's your tactic, like, hey, how about for this really dramatic scene, you make a joke, just throw in a joke somewhere, or just st stand up in a moment where right. it doesn't call for you to stand up or right. sit down. Like that to me, like blocking wise, it's like 
I'll sit if it says sit in the script mm-hmm. because usually there's a reason why if it's well written. But other than that, like, let me just do my thing. I promise you, I, I've done this before. <laughs> That's I know that sounds so like I hope it doesn't come off like cocky, no, but it's no. like I, I I I know I know where the beats are. So let me right. Let me well, take and if it. it's well written, it's you're gonna yeah. Oh yeah. If yeah. I'm I'm no joke. If something is very well written, ninety percent of the work is done for me. That's all. Yeah. It's tr- I mean, in actually those things inform the other because like I uh, I found um, as we got to know you guys on For the People, the writing became much easier yeah. because um, we knew you. And so we could use your voices and use your rhythms and 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 what what we knew ab- about you as mm. actors to write, which so I think those two things, it's really yeah, symbiotic in a way. Yeah. Oh, stole the word right out of my Sorry. mouth. I guess I am a writer. <laughs> uh, okay, I like to wrap up the show by asking uh, people nowadays what is one of the best pieces of advice they've ever gotten. It could be about life, how to deal with anxiety. Uh, so it's not really advice, but okay. it's actually something that popped into my head when we were talking about acting, mm-hmm. and I didn't mention it, but it's the thing that pops into my head now when you say this. So I used to when I used to take class at Steppenwolf West. Yeah. Um, Jeff Perry was my teacher, okay. Scandal fame. And he's my teacher before he got Scandal. And uh, it was very exciting when he booked Scandal. Anyway, that's a side note. So one of the things he – the main thing he used to say in class was um, – before you'd start a scene was let it be this time. Uh, and the idea being that you can't re- recreate what just happened. So let it be this time. Let it be Let it be time. this time. Let it, let it be this time. Let it be let, comma this time. Y- no. No. Oh, let sorry. it be this time. No commas. Let it be this time. Let it be this time. Oh, this time. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And <laughs> <I'm> so sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I would have been in the class. Like, I don't a, get it. There's a lot of uh, <laughs> there's a lot of room in there. Yeah. No, but like, it, and 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 he was saying it in the context of the scene, right? Like, don't if you, you know, had a major whatever. If you started laughing hysterically in this scene, don't try to recreate that because it'll be awful this time. Yes. Right? So let this let the, let it be this time. Let it be this time. And. I think about it in all forms of my, all parts of my life, mm. right? So like, because I do, I have a, I struggle with a lot of anxiety. And so a lot of my self-talk is like, it's going to be whatever it is. You are safe. It's okay. Yeah. And so the letting it be this time is a lot about, um, for me, like, you know, I have anxiety right now about this pilot and uh, it's been, it's been a long process of development and I don't know what's going to happen next and um, and I'm, I'm, I'm anxious about it. And at the same time, if I'm letting it be, then I can enjoy this process right now and be grateful for the fact that I sold a pitch that came from my brain. I get to write a pilot that makes me proud and whether it gets made or not, this time is magical. And so letting it be this time just like helps me to remember not to like put anything on anything or try to make anything look like anything just to let it be this time. I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Celia. Sure. Thanks for having me. Oh. <laughs> that was so cute. <laughs> you know, just like a little good. Oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> I shy now. <laughs> Music. <laughs> Let's play it out. Uh, thank you, Adobe Radio. Thank you, Nice Guy Digital. Thank you, Celia. Thank you. If people want to search you on the interwebs, where you at? Celia Fink everywhere. Celia Fink? Yeah. Nice. Not, not the Finkelstein? Just... No, it's less room for error if it's just yeah. Fink. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Peyton. Thank you, Steph. She's in the East Coast, so I can't look at her. She's looking <laughs> in the camera right now. Thank you to you, our listeners. Thank you to all our new followers and subscribers. We got a big uptick this uh, last week, which I'm like, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of more followers. We Sam's warriors are just growing by the day. <laughs> Soon I'll have an army, and then I'll be emperor. <laughs> so, boom. Perfect. <laughs> uh, what's that, Michael? Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, we're done? We're almost done oh, with time? Yeah, we're almost done with time. Oh, okay, okay. Oh. Bye, guys, always remember, listen, think, talk. Bye. <laughs>